Meanwhile, three presidential candidates on Sunday spoke on issues, policies, as well as programs they would implement if elected president next year. Rabiu Kwankunso of the New Nigeria People's Party, Atiku Abubakar of the People's Democratic Party, and Peter Obi of the Labour Party spoke at a third in the series of the Arise News presidential town halls. Well, the focus was on poverty, education, healthcare, and human capital development. Yeah. Poverty, you've seen, you've mentioned it yourself, we're one to the three. And cumulatively, the Human Development Index, we're 163 over 191. And this situation, like you've mentioned, is unacceptable and calls for one thing, the great escape. As mentioned by Nobel Prize winner in 2015 in economics, Angus Dutton of Princeton. The difference between rich and poor nation is health and education. So how do you tackle this? You tackle it by investing in this critical area. The United Nations and the World Bank believe that uh, for any government to pull out uh, people from poverty, that certainly entails uh, five major things. Uh, the issue of housing, the issue of education, the issue of health, uh, very, very important. And of course, the uh, job opportunities and so on. So um, these are things that uh, in the course of my experience, especially in Kano, we had an opportunity uh, to pull out so many people from poverty by way of uh, education mainly, right from primary, secondary to tertiary level. Uh, education has always been key to us. It's number one, number two, number three on our agenda. We have got all the statistics, uh, both internationally and locally. Uh, the most important thing is emphasized by both uh, Peter and Rabiu, fundamentally is education. Uh, we have to get our kids educated, and not educated only, but rightly educated. And then by the time you educate them, you find that they become readily available to the private sector, which should be actually the engine of growth. The private sector is the driver of prosperity in any given nation. The responsibility of the public sector, that is the government, is to see how we can incentivize the private sector to really make use of these talented young men and women who will be produced through our educational reform. All throughout these six years, our budget is not up to 10% in education. There's no way that can happen with the pool of people we have out of school. I've, for me, this, Nigeria can design their budget differently. If we work hard in this country, a, I believe Nigeria can, if they pluck all revenues, be able to get a revenue of about 15 trillion annually. And if they are borrowing, not throwing a way to subsidy and other areas and curtailing cost of governance, they borrow about maybe another 10 trillion. You need about 25 trillion budget to start with, and 10% of that should go to education, and 10% to the other areas which we're going to come into. We're going to invest in education. We're going to do whatever is possible to ensure that we pull those millions of children and ensure they get basic education. It requires more investment. Like Peter said, we are not investing enough in education. And because it particularly concerned the northern states, I call all the northern governors in Kaduna and give them a copy of the report and how to implement it. I think not one a single governor implemented that report. But then we don't have a way to force them to implement it because they are sub-regional you know, entities which have their own uh, authority in the constitution. Our own was just to advise them. So it requires real, really additional funding 
and infrastructure to be able uh, to bring up the numbers as far as the northern states are concerned and therefore uh, provide a productive population. Because all this talk of, about poverty, unemployment, and so on and so forth, once you increase investment in education and you provide the right type of education, uh, you are going to solve the poverty issue. Mr. We will Rambo. do all what it takes, really, to ensure that each and every child in this country will be given the opportunity to go to school at all levels. All right, uh, joining us now are Rise News Analyst Dr. Sam Amadi and Frank Tiete to help us understand the views of the top uh, presidential candidates that have been speaking in the last 24 hours. Uh, thank you both of you, uh, gentlemen, for joining us on News Night tonight. Apparently, uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, all candidates actually agree that education is fundamental to uh, you know, poverty eradication. But let's talk about the issue of health. The response to the question as to whether they will subject themselves to you know, scrutiny as far as their health is concerned, will they use Nigeria's health system? Did they seize the opportunity to address exactly what they will do with Nigeria's health sector? Well, thank you very much. First, uh, to say that uh, a much more relaxed and uh, friendlier environment uh, and very excellently moderated by the uh, Bubu Charles and uh, uh, and this one, here. And this one herself here. Yeah. Um, a great outing. Of course, uh, the candidates were pretty much relaxed. Again, the issue, I think it was a curveball. I mean, when I think it was this one who asked that question. Mm -hmm. uh, what would they, would they patronize if they, uh, for foreign hospital? What did they say? And try to extract commitment from each of them. I, I think they fairly handled it well. I mean, both Kwa Kwa so and uh, Peter gave emphatic yes, mm -hmm. they would be treated in Nigeria. Uh, Atuka Obaka himself uh, gave some, you know, kind of uh, a caveat, if you like, uh, which Peter himself seemed to endorse, which is basically that it's possible uh, for reference that uh, some of the uh, ailments uh, that anybody can have, including young and old persons, might require some sophisticated, if you like, uh, not available medical care. But bottom line is the sense that, like Kwaku so rightly observed, that even the things they go for medical treatment abroad are things that are routine, routine mm. things, routine checkup. I myself have done checkup in Nigeria, done abroad, and the U.S. foreign checkups seem to confirm local checkup. I mean, that's not in, no rocket science about it. So the key point here is the pen chart for you know trying to go abroad for every healthcare and look at the perverse incentive. It shows you don't have a skin in the game. If you don't have a skin in the game, you won't play that game you know, with all tenacity. If our leaders don't school their children in Nigeria, don't at, uh, attend, uh, you know, access medical care in Nigeria, they don't have strong incentive to really crack their brain, roll their sleeve, uh, and build this quality health and education facility. So I, I think it was an important question. And I think maybe this should elicit more action in terms of a memorandum, a sign off. That look, uh, somebody, one of the aspirants, that Peter or somebody said it once, that once you become an Nigerian president or aspirant or a governor who wants to be, so was becoming a president, you mm -hmm. sign up that if your kids are still in Nigeria, they're going to school in this, they're going to school in Nigeria. Right. If you're, if you're going to access all available medical, just like the vice president did, went to Lagos to get a minor surgery. I mean, this is very important, and I think uh, they gave fairly good answer. Uh, I took out back up for various reasons, couldn't commit as much as the two other persons. But again, he kind of agreed, but made a exception for the fact that, look, his particular element. And that caused the question, shouldn't you have a benchmark of assessing the health, some disclosures about our leaders, so that we know that we are actually having persons who can withstand the rigor as much as possible of executive leadership. So those are some of the issues I think fairly handled and important question was asked. Mm. And Frank Tietje, I wonder what you think, but I wanted to ask you, uh, the common denominator uh, between the candidates that presented themselves yesterday at the third series of the town hall is experience, no doubt. We heard a lot about when I was vice president, when I was governor mm -hmm. in Kano, or when I was governor in an amber state. Uh, how easy or difficult has this factor of experience brought to this round of elections for the Nigerian electorate, especially the undecided voter? 
Does it make it easier for them to make a choice? No, it doesn't. I think uh, the three candidates, uh, all of them were just living in the past yesterday. Uh, much of their reference was uh, to, the, to the past, what they did in Anambra, what they did in Kano, and what the former vice president did as uh, uh, vice president. Uh, they didn't speak to anything new. Uh, well, it was a town hall meeting, so they, 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 they were quite relaxed. They were talking to themselves. Uh, it was a convivial atmosphere. Atiku Abubaka was talking about so much incentives to be given to private sector driven uh, investors in health and uh, other areas. Uh, nobody talked much about the Talakawas that I expected uh, Rabi Ukwamkwaso to, to actually champion. So Peter B believes always in throwing money at problems and then um, uh, assuming that uh, the statistics are always applicable to the Nigerian situation. They didn't speak to anything innovative uh, with regards to our problems. Um, those have, have always maintained that debates and town hall meetings and even when they, when they are arranged or when they are special don't sway any voter in Nigeria, but it does. A, de a debate, for example, or a town hall meeting does give an, a very strong insight to the personalities of the candidates, as we saw yesterday. Uh, the three of them exhibited who they are. They are not bad at all. Rabbi Ukonkwaso, for me, was more eloquent, it was more natural, he was more at home with himself and with the issues that he was talking about. Uh, Peter Obi was a bit uptight. Uh, Atuku Abubakar, well, was the one that actually referred more to, to, to his past. But they didn't, have an, they didn't have anything other than to say their experiences. Nigeria, the Nigerian situation requires much more than that. Where the, the, where the town hall to, de, uh, to decide or to, to, to sway undecided voters, then it would have been quite pointed with regards to issues like taxes, uh, social security taxes, what will happen to the poor, how you, you, what will happen immediately in terms of uh, are you going to tax the rich to give uh, more f free services or free health services, free educational services to the poor? Are you going to have a census to, to determine who is actually, uh, who are the Nigerian citizens to be catered to and in order to reduce poverty? They didn't speak to specifics, but it was quite an enjoyable session and a whole uh, dose of referring to the past of what they have done. That's, what, that's not what Nigeria needs now. Wow, that's uh, quite interesting, an interesting position there by Frank Tete. But let's move on to uh, the man at Chatham House uh, who went to speak to the international uh, community and said, look, let me, let me try and quote what he said. You know, the next president must be chosen by the voters. But the particular issue that uh, raised a lot of eyebrow was that he uh, delegated, you know, answering to questions, key questions as to oil theft, uh, you know, security and all of that to his surrogates. Uh, Dr. Sam Amadi, I wonder what you make of that. Was that the time and place to demonstrate your ability or capacity to delegate power? Not at all. First, I, I, I spoke at Chatham House in 2014, and uh, the normal, pap uh, I, the issue about Chatham House is it's a foreign policy platform, basically. I mean, you are speaking mostly to foreign policy makers. In fact, it's interesting that, like the, the uh, Arise correspondent pointed out, that the house was fully packed most with Nigerian APC members. That's not the constituency that Chatham House designed. Chatham House is the British Foreign International Affairs, you know, think tank. And that's one. Two, uh, the Chatham House is designed, we talk about Chatham House rules, it's designed for conversations. Mm -hmm. It's not a presentation or a conference or workshop where you present the party's platform. It's where the person speaking is submitted to some rigorous question and answer so they can speak to yourself. So first is when other presidential candidates are meeting in Nigeria, talking to Nigerian constituency. The response, the counterpoise to that very important town hall is not to run to Chatham House, because that's different audience. Two, and when, of course, good speech, written scripts, you know, read well, but again, teleprompter, we saw the very inept use of teleprompter. Uh, the, the, the Ashwaju was almost like peeping and uh, clearly, uh, we saw, we see the Vice President of Nigeria, 
take teleprompter into her act. You know, you wouldn't really know his reason for the teleprompter. But this one was so obvious, struggling with it. Uh, incoherence here and there, even though the speech itself, where it is speech that uh, speaks to the foreign policy issues. The idea of delegating question, I mean, I've re I heard uh, Alake speak on, on, that, on that television channel, trying to justify it as a, a, a demonstration of team spirit. Look, when you're going to Chatham House, you're not going there to model team building, team spirit. You're going to Chatham House to speak to experts as to your concept, cognitive, about issues. It's easy to read scripts. Anybody can read a 28 minutes speech if you try to hold yourself well and go read the script. That's why we have a teleprompter. What should show your cognitive capability is question and answer. Now, question and answer first helps to know whether you comprehend the question and whether you are coordinated enough to answer those questions. So the Bola Ahmed Tinubu outsource that question to his comrades. It's not a demonstration of, of team leadership, but maybe some fright around question and answer. And I think that was the poor point of that whole game, the script. It, it, it ended badly. You just have to show that your executive mm. support can be the president by answering those questions after reading a speech obviously written for you and with the aid of a teleprompter. Okay. I, I think it doesn't watch to say, oh, this guy is showing gamemanship. No, this is a, a, sig a signal failure. Again, let's forget you're speaking to foreigners and not speaking to Nigerians, but the question is, answer those questions. Okay. Frank Tete, very quickly, jump on this. Uh, for the first time, we had the candidate of the APC try to clear the air on his age, uh, his education qualification, even ask people to do DNA if they wanted. And we do know he's standing by the date of March 1952. 52. But he also spoke about something. He talked about the level of intolerance in this politi political cycle, especially on social media. He talked about attacks and political conversations being heard that are laced with violence. Uh, what do you make of all of that? I think he has been spared much of that in Nigeria and has been shown so much mercy uh, in the Ch Chatham House today. If what happened in the Chatham House today had happened in uh, Abuja, in the town hall meeting in Abuja, uh, there would have uh, been wide protests that uh, there is no form of delegation of answers, but give it to Bola Ahmed Tinubu today. He exhibited some stamina. He read all, I, I didn't actually know he was using a teleprompter, but he exhibited some stamina uh, in reading that speech, and uh, that's, uh, it, it made a whole lot of sense and coherence. What was worrisome was the fact that uh, his handlers were unnecessarily uh, apprehensive. He, if they didn't need to, uh, you know, he could have helped himself. I don't think we should have a problem with his mannerisms or his idiosyncrasies in the, in, the, in the way or, or manner of his speech. That's his style. Slow, strong, and uh, probably, uh, you know, wavering. Well, that's his style. And we'll get used to it. You know, the real problem is the, all of the drama that was put up by all uh, these handlers. I saw one jumping up like a barrister in the criminal defense saying that he ought not to answer a question concerning uh, diaspora voting. When Tinubu himself struggled to find his way to answer that question, it turned out his answer was, was, was superb. He said, well, yeah, if, you, if you bring in so much remittances to Nigeria, you ought to exercise voting rights. So they should have allowed Tinubu to be himself, whether, no matter how he carried on, that's who he is, and Nigerians should see him for that. Unfortunately, um, the, the idea of delegation of uh, uh, answers uh, turned out uh, not to be the best, not to be very presidential. Even though I must acknowledge that Bola Metinibu is a real frontline liner. So what, tell, what, what, has hap what happened today, what it tells us is that we are going to have a presidency that will look like a headmaster that has taught, tutored his pupils, and then he calls on one of them, yeah, it's you, I taught you this, say this or say that, and then he sits back. That's not presidential uh, system of government. That is more or less like a king who is going to operate, and then there will be a lot of infighting in Asurok, uh, a lot of trading of uh, influences, and saying this is what the president said, and this is what the president didn't say. So we are going to most likely be governed by unelected people. So we are going, we're probably going to elect 
him as president if he event, uh, if that happens but the way he has performed today with Chetham House simply shows that the man is going to operate government by delegation to persons we didn't elect not even bureaucrats but persons with different agenda who don't who are not connected to the president's mind that's dangerous for, for, for us as a democracy but when it comes to the violence that he has received so far I think I, I, I think the, he, the, his handlers understood that. That's why he has escaped most of the meetings that have been, the other debates or town halls that have been uh, arranged in Abuja or Lagos. But he's gone to a quieter and more merciful place like Chatham House. That would have been un, totally unacceptable in Nigeria. Thank you so much. Mm. Uh, Frank Tete, Arise News Analyst, as well as Dr. Sam Amadi, also Arise News Analyst. Always yeah. a pleasure to have you on the news. Always.